And then you can automate procedures with practice and simulation. So for example, you know, if someone hands you a traction splint uh, during a major trauma and they say, right, just pop that on the left leg for me, please. And you haven't touched this thing for a year and you're, you're getting it out of the bag. We've all been there with something or other and you're wondering which way up it goes and what strap goes on the ankle and you're thinking, damn, I wish I'd practice this a bit more. This is actually quite embarrassing. That's taking up 100% of your cognitive bandwidth. And it would take up much less if you had rehearsed this and automated this process. And so that's with equipment, knowing your equipment's really important. And then the last example I can think of about buying cognitive space is with simulation. And this is my favorite example. Uh, a couple of months ago, I did a surgical airway on a patient. It's only the second one I've ever done on a real patient. And I must say, I was so cognitively available because I had automated that process through training. I literally could have been making dad jokes at the same time or describing my favorite recipe because, you know, I've done it twice on a human, a live human, but I've done it dozens of times on cadavers. I've done it hundreds of times on models, but I've done it thousands of times in my head. You know, I always say we have the most powerful uh, high fidelity 3d simulator in the known universe between our ears and i've used my simulator for front of neck access thousands or tens of thousands of times so it was just so automatic uh, that you know that, that's one of my favorite examples of avoiding cognitive overload by automating processes by use of your simulator and you mm -hmm. can do five surgical airways in your brain while you're queuing up for coffee um, you know, you, you don't have to get a sim lab and a debrief team and, um, you know, plan it for hours. You could just do it all in your head in a minute.